so uh, thanks for the introduction. I'm Sam. Uh, many people might not know me. Uh, I've recently moved here um, from the Malaria Atlas Project at Oxford. Um, still engage largely in malaria, and that's what we're talking about today. Um, but also do work along with uh, Tim Hallett and Jeff Eaton on a Hive Map project on uh, HIV mapping, and of course I'm part of Imperial India Outbreak Centre. So uh, today's talk is going to be, um, it'll, it'll contain seasonality, but it wouldn't necessarily be the, the only goal to, to describe seasonal influences on malaria. Um, and what I want to go, we'll go into is uh, some new work that I've been working on, which is looking at this concept of uh, residual transmission on, uh, on malaria. Um, and in a roundabout way, I'll, I'll talk through the seasonal influences as I get there. So to start off, for those unfamiliar to mapping, um, I wanted to talk through the key components to mapping, um, introduced by, by Peter Diggle and, and Rasmussen and Williams. Um, and those who are, are more used to machine learning methods will instantly recognize this as a supervised learning problem. But essentially, these are the components that go in to actually build some maps. Um, First thing you need is some response data, geolocated response data at some locations with some measure of interest, for example, malaria prevalence. Prevalence defined by the number of individuals sampled at a location that are, say, positive by uh, diagnost some diagnostic test out of a total number. Then, aside from that, you um, go out and you collect a, a huge amount of satellite imagery, and I'll, I'll show some pictures of it, and this is where the whole seasonality comes into it. Um, but these satellite images don't always have to be just environmental factors. They can be um, factors such as uh, nighttime lights or derived factors um, like uh, accessibility, which is a project we're currently running with, with Google now, which is building a worldwide map of accessibility and travel time. Feeding into that, you need some model. This model converts uh, this predictor data to match the response data by some uh, loss, some characteristic or some fitting characteristic. Uh, this body of theory used to be called model-based geostatistics, but now I, I believe it's just more commonly referred to as some form of learning paradigm. Uh, and once you've put all these pieces together, uh, you get uh, an output map, and I think this was a, a map of poverty as defined by multidimensional poverty index. Um, so we're here to talk about the environmental drivers. One classic environmental driver is uh, this, the normalized difference vegetation index. Um, and it's, a, it's a nicely intuitive metric that you can get from satellite imagery. Uh, simply, plants will absorb a huge amount of uh, sunlight in photosynthesis uh, and reflect back radiation in the near infrared. So that's what you're measuring. You're measuring back the near infrared, and it gives you a proxy of greenness. Now, this proxy of greenness, of course, it's not directly related to malaria transmission, but it's correlated through some complex uh, function. Um, and, and, and part of the whole geostatistical paradigm, apart from just learning spatiotemporal characteristics, is to actually learn what this function is uh, in the terms of the relationship between a metric, say, malaria prevalence and uh, something like the normalized vegetation index. But of course, uh, that metric can be static, and, and normally it is static, because uh, when, when, when you have a satellite circling the globe every six hours, some location every six days. Sorry, some some locations are are fantastic. You know, the Sahara will have no clouds, and you'll get perfect data there. But many many rainforest areas will be filled with cloud cover, um, and so a, a, lo a lot of uh, researchers in the field won't use this uh, so-called temporally dynamic data. But I mean, you can instantly see that the differences in greenness as you go from different months, from little vegetation to large vegetation. Uh, this is the EVI, a similar metric to NDVI. From this seasonal data, you can get really, well, first of all, you have to do a large gap-filling exercise. And, and this is work that we did, uh, led by, by Dan, um, a while back. But you can get derived products as well. It, it, you can run these metrics through pre-processed functions to get um, biological models. For example, temperature suitability. If you know what daytime temperature is around the entire globe, you can simply look at the periods at which you have the suitable temperature for mosquito larvae to say emerge. Um, and you can look at different seasonal trends. And seasonality matters crucially when doing modeling such as this, because it, you, know, you, you can never trump uh, data by simply modeling something more complicated. There's a huge amount of information in here that no model will be able to capture. For example, uh, say a rapid deforestation occurs somewhere. You're not going to be able to capture that in, in a model that's modeling some sort of seasonal trend by a 
are mixtures of sines, cosines, etc. Um, and so, and so you can capture that with this dynamic data. Uh, and I hope everyone can see this. You know, I've just taken four different regions and just plotted the time series. Say on the one hand, you have a synoptic time series. You, you don't have any yearly data, and you're just looking and seeing what's happening each month. Um, you can crucially miss very important patterns that could happen in, in, in a given year. So we're looking at the monthly patterns and the spikes up in greenness in EBI in location D, which is, a, which is just has a, you know, the African one peak rather than the two peaks. And if you look in this corner over here, um, a synoptic, uh, just using synoptic data would miss um, a crucial greening that occurred over here, um, whereas in some places it does quite well. And in some places, actually, the, the variation is so marked that the average can miss a huge amount of, of information. So previously, what we had done was we'd, we'd taken all this environmental data along with data on interventions, such as uh, bed nets, spraying, uh, and drugs like optimism and based combination therapies, and we predicted change through time uh, in malaria prevalence. So this map in 2000 shows this wonderful positive story of malaria prevalence re declining to what we observe as 2015 levels. So uh, that what we'd previously shown, which is, uh, you know, now that I've introduced some, some parts of seasonality, what we'd previously shown is that Climate change actually matters less, and a, and a large amount less, than human interventions. Um, and this was shown by, by Pete Getting you know, a while back. Um, you know, if you look at the historical changes uh, from 1900 to now, <laughs> even if you look at the historical changes over the last 10 years, um, you know, climate isn't playing the factor and the decisive role in why prevalence is going up and down. It's, it's, it's entirely, or not entirely, I should say, uh, but it's predominantly uh, driven by by human interaction. Um, more recently, we showed that interventions actually have had a huge impact and caused large declines. A real success story that's happened uh, over the last 15 years, um, thanks to a large international effort and driving down cases, prevalence, and to some degree mortality in Africa. Of course, we're now at the stage where we, we, we take a, a sober look back uh, and uh, don't rest off the winds and, and, and look forwards. And the, the key recognition is that uh, bed nets and spraying don't look like they'll eliminate malaria alone, because we're starting to look and talk about elimination in some African countries. And that residual transmission after scale-up is very, very poorly understood. So what are the key questions that, that we're sort of trying to answer now in this, uh, in this new, shall I say, uh, research agenda moving forwards? Uh, and the first one is, what are the human and environmental factors that are contributing to this residual transmission? By this I mean interventions might drive down malaria a huge amount or they, they should drive down prevalence and transmission intensity a huge amount in some places. In some places they're still being kept high and we don't know why. And, and, and this heterogeneous pattern across Africa is very, very important for us to understand how this interacts with the effectiveness of the most widely used intervention, which is insecticide-treated bed nets. Um, and, and the reason that bed nets have had the biggest impact is, of course, they are... It's not to say they're more efficacious than, say, spraying. It's just uh, by virtue of being the predominant intervention out there. We're trying to also look at what are the background factors other than malaria control that have reduced transmission across Africa. So species differences, um, the kind of houses people live in, um, whether people live in impervious housing structures, um, even more remote proxies like um, whether houses are electrified or not, um, and, of course, agri a whole suite of agricultural indicators that are hypothesized to have an impact. Uh, examples of some, some pretty maps of these indicators. Uh, we have the species distributions uh, fitted from case data, uh, rather more speculative but rather more smooth. Distributions of chicken density, cattle density for zoonotic vectors, uh, rice and sugar productions for also interactions. Um, and also looking at uh, slightly more demographic variables other than just accessibility. So things like nighttime lights, uh, measuring uh, urbanicity, um, looking at impervious surfaces, and more recently looking at the quality of housing. And, and you can see the, the differences between the years 2000 and 2015 here. Now, I'm going to switch track to uh, the, the slightly more mathematical aspects of this uh, for those interested in the audience. Um, up till recently, there's been this geostatistical paradigm. You, you get these, these satellite images or so-called covariates, independent variables, and then you look at what's left over, this, 
there's some structure left over, and this is what people refer to as the residual spatial temporal variation or space time covariance. It depends on the very different names. So you're looking at how some variable gamma changes with regard to some spatial separation, some spatial distance, say the distance between two cities, and some temporal separation, say those two cities separated over a yearly period. Uh, and so in changing this geophysical paradigm, we're now looking at spaces that are not just space-time, but rather 30 plus dimensions. I, you're looking in the actual covariance space plus space-time and trying to learn through flexible kernels. Now, the interesting work done in this was published uh, recently by uh, Rahimi and Recht uh, in their seminal work in 2007. Uh, and what, what they recognized was there's this uh, famous theorem, a very old theorem called Bochner's theorem, that guarantees that any stochastic process can be expressed through um, a spectral density. So a stochastic process would be just some function that's completely random, and you can get realizations of that random function. You don't need to work as a, with the stochastic process explicitly. You can work with the spectral density. Now, the, the, the key tool that everyone does when you see an integral of an RD like that is change that to a sum and do a Monte Carlo simulation on that. And that's exactly what Rahimi and Vec did. They also recognized a, a great innovation in that there's always two ways to solve a problem. You can solve a problem in the primal, or you can solve a problem in the dual, the dual in any optimization scenario. Up till recently, everything has been solved in the dual, and that, that's because doing um, it, optimizing in the dual is, is, is a lot more efficient when you have uh, little data, but in this modern big data age where we're getting huge amounts of data, suddenly we can move to optimizing in the primal, where you, you look at a different loss function. Now, the, the, the other key innovation in this point is that... Um, well, I've gone into 30, 30 dimensions. Everyone has some intuition of uh, the curse of dimensionality in those 30 dimensions. I mean, how many points do I need in a 30-dimensional space? Well, it becomes exponentially large, so the number of data to the power 30, which is an unfathomable number, really. But these models are so-called regularized, so they take this 30-dimensional space and you do the learning in a lower-dimensional subspace. Um, and we've implemented all of this in uh, Google's TensorFlow. So we finally have a framework that can do uh, very, very complicated mapping and ask really interesting causal questions, including nonlinearities, interactions, but doing this in a rigorous way that doesn't require you to just design interactions and features, but can do it uh, as w automatically through the learning process. In addition, I have just told you that any random process can be uh, described through a spectral density. Well, <coughs> now when you, when, you, when you hear the word density, you think maybe a Gaussian density or a gamma density. But if you go into mixture models, you can basically use any density because mixture models are dense in the space <laughs> of densities in the same way that kernels are dense in the space of functions. And so we use a mixture model. And, and the intuition behind it, that's the spectral domain and that's the covariance domain, the intuition behind it is that, well, what if I want to you know, uh, capture some pattern of extrapolation in the data that I just couldn't get by any other means? Um, these mixture models allow you to get the density to do that, and some intuition is there in the cosine for seasonal dynamics as well. So enough with the, uh, with the math, maths and uh, going off to just some preliminary findings from the residual transmission work. Um, and uh, the findings are sobering, so to speak. Um, this is our map in 2015 uh, using this, this new model. Um, and we, we found during this, you know, huge, interesting interactions between species, uh, most of the time in what, in what individuals have thought in terms of how Gambier increases transmission and the other vectors. I forget which way around it is that reduces it, um, how housing influences this, all in intuitive ways. But the, the, the big message here is that if we chose to go to a counterfactual scenario where... Uh, we, we, we throw in money and we ramp up bed nets to an 80% level. Um, as you can see, there are huge reductions, and the eyes get drawn to DRC, but if you look at, at the rest of the map, you can see large reductions in Eastern Africa, Southern Africa, but you still see this entrenchment, this weird entrenchment in West Africa. Uh, and sadly, the, the, the message uh, is that we still don't know what was causing this residual transmission. We've explained quite a lot of it, but there's still a host of factors which... We, we still don't know what's causing it. And uh, finally, if you're looking at, um, at 
the overarching message of this work? Well, first one, there have been reduction, the green, green boxes, there have been huge reductions across the board between 2000 and 2015. Wonderful international efforts, saving lives, it's really great. Um, if we continue this way, well, we'll get further reductions. Some countries much larger than others. And these are the blue bars then. And this is, if we moved up ITN coverage to 80%, we're still going to get huge declines, but much less now. And why? Because of the annoying red bars. There's still residual transmission that we aren't able to capture. And so in this work, we tried to uh, include as many variables as possible in the most rigorous way that, that, that current mathematics will allow, at least in my opinion. Um, and they, the message is we still, don't, we still don't know what large part of residual transmission is. We've explained a lot of it, but we still don't know what large chunks of it, um, what's causing large chunks of it. And that's for us to do in the future. So that's it, thanks.